All right, everyone. I am super excited to be here with Michael I. Jordan, Distinguished Professor in the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science and the Department of Statistics at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, Professor Jordan, welcome to the Twimmel AI podcast. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. It, it is super exciting for me to have you on the show. Uh, you are connecting or we are connecting uh, with you being in Italy right now. And so, uh, you know, folks, we might experience a little bit of delay, but wanted to, you know, start by having you share a little bit about what brought you to Italy. Uh, interesting turn of events where Italy was a early hotspot uh, for coronavirus, but now it sounds like uh, things are going pretty well in the country. Uh, yeah, it's it, there will be a bit of a delay, but I hope that people will appreciate how amazing it is that we're talking across the ocean right now and these packets are <laughs> flying back and forth. And um, yeah, it's, it's very, very striking. Uh, my, my spouse is Italian and I have Italian passport therefore. And so with the kids, we decided we'd come to Italy about in midsummer because it's uh, this is the Eastern uh, far eastern side of Italy and life is really quite open. So the restaurants are open. You can walk around town and the kids can have a normal life. Um, so that that's uh, why we're here. We probably can't stay much longer because I need to get back and start, start work back in, in Berkeley. But uh, it is an example of a country. Maybe it's because it's smaller but um, and maybe because they had a trauma early on. But people took it really, really seriously. And I think for about four to six weeks, you really literally didn't go out of your apartment. It was the the whole bloody lockdown, and uh, mm. if you follow the trend, they really brought it down to near zero, and now it stays around a few hundred per day. Um, and they do the contact oh. tracing and so on and so forth. So somehow they learned quickly that there's a few things to do that are right, and I think it's taking everybody else a, a lot longer to get to get on board with uh, the the simple but but uh, critical things to do to keep this thing uh, in check. Mm. That's amazing. That's amazing. Well, I, I'd love to start by hearing a little bit about uh, your career and how you, you know, how your interests in machine learning, artificial intelligence, and all the other things that you work on began. In 2016, you were named one of the most influential computer scientists worldwide. Um, so, uh, you know, did you start out with that in mind? Yeah, no, I didn't. And I, 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 um, I'm glad that computer science somehow welcomed me in along the way because I, um, I really ed headed in a different direction earlier on. I think I was influenced by philosophy. Uh, there was a bi autobiography I read by Bertrand Russell when I was a kid that um, it, it's like three volumes. And uh, it's, he was sort of the early part of the century, last century. Um, thinking about uh, the mind and the brain and and uh, logic and th and thought and uh, psychology and so on and so forth and uh, so that got me sort of kind of uh, aware that there could be a science emerging of the mind and aware that it had something to do with their traditions and philosophy of inductive thinking and deductive thinking and so on and so forth uh, but that was my vague uh, awareness um, um, I did not grow up with particularly good education and I just and they continue to this day. Now, a little random, but um, uh, I uh, was intrigued by the idea that the big problems of our day had to do with with not just computers, but with algorithms and with um, with dealing with uncertainty in the real world. So, computers. Uh, what I found missing in computers when I finally came to computer science. Uh, by the time I'd been already in cognitive science and seeing kind of humans who are thinking somewhat logically, but not entirely. And it was intriguing to me how we can be not logical, but at the same time, we're so powerful. And so computers didn't seem to have that. And it, it felt to me that um, computers needed to, to, to move out of the purely deductive world that they'd gotten kind of uh, focused on. Uh, so when I, by the time I came to computer science, I was already interested in inference and in decision-making and economic ideas and and so on and so forth. Um, but it really is quite a random walk. And I, I like to, I'd like to say that uh, I, I really like interacting with students and helping them with career decisions and helping them think about what 
what is the future and where it's going and all that. Talking about that, I think is really helpful, not just to me, but to, for figuring out my next, my own next steps, which are always vague and unsure, but uh, for especially for younger people um, to, to orient themselves in this kind of uh, thicket of ideas. That that's awesome. Uh, so your your academic home, at least at Berkeley, is in this the the WCS and stats. Uh, but you've also done quite a bit of work in cognitive sciences and biology uh, as well. Um, do, are you still active in those communities? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm active in them, um, a little less so right now. My main focus is bringing economics ideas together with inference and and computer science. Um, but even there, you, you know, you find themes that uh, are familiar from past lives. Mm -hmm. um, so, in fact, economics is full of kind of Bayesian thinking and where do the preferences come from and how do people, you know, approach economics problems, how do, how, how do actors, how do agents behave and so on. So you're, you're in the world of cognitive science, uh, you know, to some degree. Um, mm -hmm. uh, biology was really just because, again, it's, a, it's, the, it's the topic of the era. And so anybody who's living in this era who doesn't learn about molecular biology and uh, the immune system and cancer and whatnot, um, you know, I don't think is quite living the full intellectual life they could. Uh, moreover, our field of data analysis and, and um, um, large scale data analysis in particular obviously had a lot of connections to what was happening in, in biology. And I wanted to kind of uh, uh, lend an ear and hear what was going on and see and, and see if I could contribute and I that, that continues. Uh, so I've learned a bit about proteins. I've learned a bit about um, you know, how enzymes work and um, and um, learned a bit about a genomics and uh, the three dimensional structure of the genome is something I'm currently interested in. Um, and uh, these are just kind of all that's almost more of an intellectual hobby. Uh, but my main focus really is kind of learning algorithms and how they behave when you put them in real-world de deployments and how they behave when there's large collections of people involved and where all that's going. Mm -hmm. uh, and you mentioned that one of your your primary interests today is in the uh, economic realm and how that uh, interplays with inference and, and other things in, in the ML and AI world. Uh, elaborate a little bit on, on that. What's, the, what's your, your thinking and direction there? Yeah, so I never was really an AI person in the sense that um, it was never the main thing in my life to have a uh, a computer replace a human being. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that was kind of that's kind of an interesting aspiration about could that be possible? Um, you know, I don't think it, it's impossible. I do believe it's possible. I don't believe it's going to happen in our lifetimes. Um, humans are just too amazingly rich, uh, richly intelligent and deep and broad and so on. Um, you know, that said, it's a fantastically interesting philosophical question. Um, but I was always more interested in more the implications of um, algorithmic styles of thinking and what that meant if you put it out there in the world. And in, in other words, uh, there was a whole new infrastructure that links people like, like this network is linking us right now, transmitting the bits. But what if it was more aware in some sense, or what if uh, the, um, the bits are uh, given economic value, so that we're actually some tra transactions are happening, or that you know the value is being uh, recorded and and uh, created, and um, you know what if there's kind of a market happening behind the scenes here, you know, uh, people are being connected anyway. So what are the consequences of connecting all of us? But not just connecting humans. What are the con the consequences of all the connections behind the scenes? Um, so if you think about just to be concrete, like the, the current COVID, uh, coronavirus issues, um, we're all reading as much as we can about it, but behind the scenes, there's this vast network that involves doctors and people and researchers, but it also involves lots of data, lots of computers, lots of measurements, and putting it all together and then having it flow um, so just that the right ideas are present at the right time and the right decisions are being made for the right people um, is a non-trivial you know, exercise. Um, and, and it's not even being treated as an exercise, really. I think it's kind of all just ad hoc. You know, we just do the best we can with what we've got. Uh, but, you know, like think about the banking system just as a point of comparison. Think about the ATMs, right, that we all can now go around the world. This wasn't possible in my parents' generation. We can go around the world and have a little card. We don't even need a card anymore, really. It's a cell phone. And our money is available to us anytime in any place. And, uh, you know, 
billions, I don't know, maybe trillions of transactions are happening per day and they're not, and they're all correct. And even if the electricity goes out in the ATM machine, well, I'm halfway through my transaction, no problem. Um, you know, if I take out money here and my wife takes out money across the world, uh, we don't get docked twice and yeah. so on and so forth. It's just, it's kind of, uh, you know, it's astonishing that it works and it really does. And, and, uh, and, you know, there's huge consequences if it didn't work, you know, our financial system could be endangered. There's lots of criminals trying to make it not work and, you know, just all kinds of things like that. So, um, it's not perfect, but it's sort of amazing and, and has had a big impact. And the current sort of medical response to COVID is nothing like that, right? It's it's an ad hoc collection of things where, you know, maybe some doctor read something somewhere and that, you know, triggered some thought. And, you know, and there's that's fine. There's a lot of that going forward. But it also would be nice if, um, you know, that we wouldn't have so much loss of, you know, of human life and, and heartache if uh, the right ideas were not kind of transmitted at the right times. Um, and... Uh, so looking back, that will be more and more possible. Uh, just like looking back, you know, when people started to first build electrical systems or chemical systems and factories and, and you know, steam engines and all that, eventually they got it right and it really was great. And it just did a lot of the wonderful things for people. But along the way, it was really not great. And, it, mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of where we are right now. We're creating all kinds of artifacts, you know, including social networks that... Um, you know, just look fun, like fun. Let's just connect everybody up. It's easy, but it's turned out to not be so great in many ways right. that it's pretty damaging to the human human spirit, really. Mm -hmm. um, and so a field that builds those systems should also be a field aware that's aware of the consequences of building that and uh, able to kind of steer it and, you know, or at least, you know, be transparent about what could happen and let people uh, avoid some of the, the bad consequences. We're not there. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But there's there's so much in there. Um, can you maybe give us a few examples of when you're thinking about these these large scale systems and uh, applying kind of an economic lens to them? Uh, what are some of the you know specific questions that that prompts for you and how you uh, investigate those? Yeah. Um uh, yeah, let's let's indeed be real concrete. I think that'll that'll really um, help the conversation. Help me too to kind of prep <laughs> things more cl as clearly as possible. So I'm I'm getting my favorite example these days. Uh, which if you've seen other podcasts with me my, to the audience, and my apologies, this is you've heard it before. But it has to do with music, and um, it has to do with kind of people who make music and people listen to music, right? <laughs> and um, and, and I, I was lucky enough to meet someone named Steve Stout, who who is a friend, and he he's a uh, an entrepreneur, and he's also kind of been a music, uh, uh, you know, heavily involved in the music world, the, the you know, the recent music world, let's say hip hop and Latin music and, and so on and so forth. So mm -hmm. um, I got to know him and um, he and I have kind of bounced thoughts back and forth. And so some of my thinking has been influenced by Steve. Uh, there's a company that he has that I have been on the board of advisors. It's called United Masters. And um, it has at latest, I think, a few hundred thousand musicians signed up. All right, so what is going on there? What is, why are musicians signing it to a company? Why do I find that interesting? Uh, right, well, uh, music is a, uh, has economic value, all right? And, and, and it should, why should it have economic value? Well, because people who make music should be able to have a living, you know, have a job and be able to have a career, you know, making music. Um, it shouldn't be doing it just for fun or, or just for, you know, an a job. Um, and in fact, looking forward, people talk a lot about a missing job. And, um, so that's an example of something that shouldn't be a missing job. It should be a real job. Um, sadly, at that uh, market, uh, that ability to have a job in a world like creating music doesn't really exist. And this seems strange because there's studios all over the world. There's, there's you know, music flows everywhere. It's, it's uh, you know, so surely there is a very healthy uh, music market world. Uh, and the answer, the fact is there's not. Uh, that there's a few people who still make, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, they were plucked out. They have talent, but they were amplified then by a system that 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 uh, made them superstars. Um, and you would think that, well, it, that's just how life is, that everyone wants to listen to the superstars. Uh, and they do listen to the superstars, and that's fine. And that's just, and then there's a lot of other people that make money in some, some penumbra. Uh, but you'd be wrong about that. No one. The, the fact is, if you look at the data, that 95% of the music being listened to today 
was not made by the superstars. It was made by people you never heard of. And 95% of the music that's been listened to today was music done in the last two years. Mm. So these are kind of things that no one knows, uh, but it suggests there's a whole missing market. So who are, who's mm. making this music and, and, and who's listening to it? Well, it's, it's largely a culture phenomenon. It's an inner city phenomenon. There's lots of kids who, you know, that's what they do. They get a laptop and then make music. And uh, yeah. their music is often good enough that, um, that they, you know, they stream it somewhere and it gets picked up on and uh, they can actually become popular, popular enough that a lot of people will listen to them. And then they're mm -hmm. the cool people to listen to. And that's who's actually listened to, if, you know, if you uh, hang around younger people. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, so isn't that just all great? Well, no, that's a sad story because those kids who made that music, you know, within a year or two, they won't have a job. Right. And, and they really, this is so, um, so what can you do to fix that? Uh, so now, in some sense, the AI or data science comes into play, which is that every time someone's music is being streamed across these great networks that we've built, some economic value should accompany that. And, and I don't mean micropayments. I mean that uh, if one of these kids is making a lot of music and, and, and you know hundreds of thousands of people, not even millions, are listening to them, they should be able to see on a dashboard at the end of the week who's listening to them, where, where in the country. Here's a dot every time your music was listened to. All right. And uh, if they turn out to be popular in a particular city, they should be able to tell the venue owners and say, look, I'm popular there. Let me come play in your city. And we'll, uh, we'll broadcast to the audience because I'm connected to the audience. Right. I, I, I have that data. And uh, so the data is the currency of the realm here. The data says that I now know I'm popular and I can prove to you I'm popular. And so I'll come give a show there and I'll make, you know, $25,000. Um, and if I do that three or four times a year, I, there's a salary right there. All right. Um, moreover, if I start to get connected to my fans, I can offer them to come backstage. I can offer them to call, play at your wedding for $20,000 or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I can start to build a life and a career. Right. And, and it's now not some company that's doing this for me or some agent. It's me. All right. I'm empowered to do this. All right. And I, I'm able to do this because of the data flow and, and people like me paying attention to what the data is and how to get it into the hands of the people who can act on it and helping to create a market where the producers are connected to the consumers. Okay. Um, so this company, United Masters, is doing a good chunk of that equation, which is that it has signed up these young artists telling them, don't sign with a record company, sign up with us. And we will help you to, we will be the data scientists for you. We'll let you have a record company in your pocket and we'll let you um, manage these things. Uh, moreover, we will act as an agent for all of you. So if you, you know, the NBA website now, if you go there and listen to music there by, as you're watching the clips, it's these, it's these artists. So I get excited by that because I see that a little bit of AI and data science, the, the building of a producer consumer market, mm -hmm. the pay attention to the long tail, the uh, concern about uh, the matching um, and the balancing, uh, the using of you know game theoretic and mark you know uh, matching principles along with recommendation system principles, kind of all the guts of good le machine learning systems. Um, if you start to do that right, you can actually create this thing as a healthy market. And I can see it, you know, uh, very soon within not just our lifetime, but in the next few years, kind of a million people in the U.S. being involved in such a market where their music is being listened to and able to monetize it, um, you know, all the merchandise that's being sold around it and, and so on and so forth. And I can see not just in the U.S., I can see Brazil, you know, China, uh, et cetera, each having their own music systems. And, uh, and I can see companies emerging to support this. So um, in some sense, this all seems naive and easy and simple, and why not, you know, of course, um, but you know, it's not been what IT has done. IT has created like search engines or or, or uh, social networks, which are services that aim to you know provide connections among people. But no one, it doesn't actually preserve economic value or create new economic value. Uh, it just gives you data, and then you have to monetize it with advertising. Um, and so that that's wrong. I, I mean, it's it's limited. It's not wrong. It's just limited. And if instead you say, no, my job as an IT person or an AI person is to create this system 
that uh, is a real market and allows people to come in and they participate in the way they choose. Um, and I'm just going to run the system and make sure that everybody gets connected up in the right way. Um, and I'm going to do this at a brand new scale. It's not going to be 10 people or a hundred or a thousand. It's going to be millions. Uh, and, and in doing so, I'm like a real engineer. It's like a chemist who went from, you know, take test tubes in the lab who could then build a factory and tell you that that thing is going to work. And so if as a field, we started to orient towards building that sort of thing, guaranteeing that it'll work, bringing in people, uh, uh, ensuring transparency, ensuring a working system, uh, thinking about how to do that, it's not trivial. Um, you know, then I, I think that that would be a really uh, great chunk of labor for us. It would be something we would do that we'd be proud of, something that would actually make the world a better place. Um, and that's just music. So we could go on and talk about other disciplines, you know, news or art or mm -hmm. whatever, where our, our, our style of work, uh, IT systems could create new ways for people to interact that actually give them value, that not just kind of hook them up and then I make money off of you by advertising. Uh, so I hope I give it enough of a flavor there. That was kind of long. It was obviously very long winded, <laughs> um, but it's not that common to hear people think that way. It's more common to think, uh, hey, I can build a company. I can use all this latest gizmo stuff, you know, yeah, you know, IT stuff, and people will be attracted, and then I'll make money off of some way. I'll make it with advertising or whatever. That, done. That's the, yeah. that's that's great. And then if I if I'm a, an AI guy, I'm going to take all that data and I'm going to create super intelligence, and I'll put that in there in the mix too, and I'll even make more money. I don't know what, what you know what people have in mind, really. Um, but you know, the naivete of all of that is breathtaking. Um, and uh, just a little bit of down to earth. Hey, wait, isn't there a market here? Hey, can't we get some money into the hands of 16 year olds who are doing cool stuff? Hey, can't we rethink this whole equation of what uh, the IT is being used for? Um, I just don't hear it enough. And so I may be willing to sort of say naive things about it, but just to sort of say, uh, if you're a younger person, think about doing that. Create a company that creates a market that makes money for other people. You can take your little commission. That's great. That's a wonderful thing to aspire to. And if you're an academic, Think about, hey, how could I actually create a market with millions of people or hundreds of millions of people uh, that actually works, you know, th that isn't attackable or it doesn't collapse in a heap? You know, how could I do that? And is the is the core element of interest in there the the idea of a, a marketplace, you know, whether it's, you know, two sided or, or, or multi sided? Is that what is driving a lot of your interest? Uh, and, and, and I'll add yeah. on to that a little bit. Uh, one of the things that is really interesting about your work and some of your writings is that you often come back to this idea of kind of planetary scale. Um, and, um, you know, I, one of the best examples we have of that is the, is, is the internet. Um, and uh, we referenced that a little bit earlier, the bits flying around. Um, but, you know, you don't think of that as a, a marketplace necessarily. It's kind of this, you know, undifferentiated infrastructure that was made available that we figured out all these incredible things to, to do with. Um, and so do you think this idea of a, of a marketplace is kind of a, a next frontier in, in, in some way? Or uh, is that, uh, you know, just an example of, you know, one of these, you know, planetary scale systems that uh, you think is interesting? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, first of all, I don't necessarily love the word marketplace, and, and but I find that when I use that terminology, a lot of people argue with me. So I must be onto something. <laughs> yeah, I must be onto something. So, you know, it's, um, it's odd. If I talk about gradient descent or learning or AI, the market is starting to get way. Isn't the market responsible for all of these social ills? Um, isn't the market responsible? You know, so I, I give a talk in an academic uh, conference of, of about a year ago. Uh, just totally technical, geeky kind of people wanting to see the latest equations. Uh, and at the end of it, I you know mentioned the word market. They said, "Well, markets are terrible, aren't they?" And I said, "Really?" And he says, "Yeah, it's." It was a he. Uh, he said, "It's responsible for global warming." And, you know, so it was like, okay, we need to step back a moment here and take a deep breath. Um, you know, so, um, you know, markets weren't created by academics or by powerful people. It was created, you know, somehow by human interactions thousands of years ago. And it was like, you have a little something, I have a little something. Hey, we could trade and we'd both be happier. And, uh, and, and so it's a kind of an force of nature. Um, it doesn't mean that it's like it solves all problems or that it's a good force of nature, you know, or, or good or bad. It's just there. It, it is there. 
Um, it's been underexploited in our field. So, you, you know, the internet, no, I don't think it is a market, right? The internet was a kind of human attempt to have no scarcity, uh, c constant availability, you know, no limits, right? And that's not real life, right? Real life is about limits and about scarcity and about trade-offs. I can't do this because you're wanting to do this, or I can't do this because I got limits on my time or on, you know, that's real life. The mature human being is able to manage these kind of, you know, trade-offs. They can't do everything they want to do. And the internet was something about, no, no, no trade-offs, folks. You give as much bits and bandwidth as you want, and let's just keep working and working and working. So that's true, right? And that's somehow just not real. And it had to kind of eventually lead to some sort of, you know, you know, effectively chaos. And there's a bit of, we have a lot of social chaos right now driven by that way of thinking that it's all fine. Um, so markets are actually kind of more of a constraint, which is that, hey, you're in, game, in the game, I'm in the game too. We can both can what we want, but maybe we'll find a way that we're both a little bit happy. All right. So, um, uh, so another way I like to, I'd like to say it is that, oh, you don't like markets. Well, you know, suppose I'm trying to do a form of engineering. I'm trying to do a mechanical engineering. Uh, you know, I, I know a little physics and I know a little fluid flow or something. And now I'm trying to create this new field where I build buildings and bridges or whatever. And I'm going to have principles for that, you know, based on basic physics. All right. And now the question is, do I, should I use gravity or not in my new field? You know, well, I could say, well, gravity, sure, I could use gravity. It's part of physics, right? I have to use it. And someone said, say, well, no, but gravity is a terrible thing. What does gravity do? How many people die a year from gravity? Well, you know, lots. People fall down and hurt themselves in all kinds of ways because of gravity, right? And so, you know, gravity should be avoided at all costs. It's really evil. All right. And so that's a stupid way to think, right? And um, the right thing, way to think about it is that gravity is just a force of nature. We can use it and we should, uh, but we should also control it and be aware of the consequences and all that. So same thing with markets. It's a force of nature. You you know, turning it off is, is, is a bad idea. Um, uh, so, but use it, but then be aware of what the consequences are. And, and, and moreover, markets, you know, gravity is kind of one thing. I mean, maybe it's not, I'm not a physicist, but uh, markets aren't one thing. So there's matching markets, there's auctions, there's just all kinds already in economics. And as we go forward with learning systems invading into microeconomics, you know, brand new kinds of markets have to emerge. Um, you know, so like, you know, second price auction markets, that was a discovery just now, you know, in our lifetime. Um, and there's just to be all kinds of new mechanisms like that that need to be discovered to make these markets actually safe and interesting and healthy and work at the scales we need to work at and all that. And that's an emerging field. Um, and so, yeah, we're just saying uh, markets and we're done, that, that solves all problems. No, but markets as a uh, way to, to uh, uh, bring in more constraints into your problem, make it a little more social um, and uh, um, hint at all the challenges and then try to, to, to knock them off. Yeah, I'm very enamored with that way of thinking. So no, the internet's not a market. The internet was just kind of a pipe. Um, that's fine. Um, but I think we're going to be a much more mature field when we start to at least have a little bit of appreciation for the word market. Mm -hmm. uh, you're, when you, when you, in the example that you gave with the, the music uh, company, one of the key themes there was this idea of empowerment. Um, but I think, you know, just kind of following along on this markets thread, um, you know, we've also seen examples of, you know, markets, um, you know, and I'm thinking of, you know, not to name a certain four letter ride sharing company, but, you know, using yeah. their market power to, uh, you know, ultimately, uh, allegedly take advantage of, you know, gig economy workers. Um, I, yeah. I'm curious, I guess maybe the question, you know, there is, you know, you know, do you think government regulation is a kind of a necessary component of markets or do you believe that, you know, something else? Oh yeah, no, I, I totally believe that government regulation is needed. Um, yeah, so I I, I I I know enough economists to know too that most of them agree that you know, there was this thing called the Chicago School where unregulated markets were going to solve all the world's problems, and that, that's just that's just not not true. Yeah, not you know empirically. Um, and I think as we develop these brand new kinds of markets that are operating at scales kind of beyond the human capacity, faster than we ever could think, or bigger than we could ever con conceive of. Um, that it's not going to be just the kind of working it out at the local level kind of that humans will fight with each other and 
if you cheated me, I'll, I'll come find you, you know? Well, it's not, it, so we need, we need, yeah, others, we need many hierarchies of structures, starting from the local to the more global. Um, and we're gonna have to work out in tandem as we develop these learning systems and these data oriented systems that help us make decisions that are in the world, whatever you wanna call it, it's happening. And so I think taking in a, a mature market perspective will help, but then working with lawyers, legal people, working with sociologists, working with people who are public policy people, um, and trying to figure out what are the appropriate ways to regulate here so that we do the right thing. Economics also has a beautiful, it's kind of a dour field, right? It has this kind of, uh, hey, I think I'm doing the right thing by putting in this mechanism, but the consequences of that are that, you know, incentivizes somebody to come in and do something that breaks entirely what I do. Well, uh, you know, economists are pretty good at now thinking that through all the way to the end and sort of seeing, well, okay, that didn't work, but here's another way to do it. And I think, again, if we partner and we kind of work uh, with that style of thinking that um, we, it'll help us to understand what kind of ways to structure these markets. Um, also, this field of mechanism design is very kind of, it's probably the, the field, part of the economics closest to computer science, where you start to get the constraints and the algorithms of computer science. And it's not just open it up and it's a market and it works. It's no, that gives you, a, that's like gravity. That gives you a lot of the force, the basic uh, oomph there. Um, but then on top of that, you got to put various, these kind of constraints. You got to run the auction in this kind of way. You got to go up and down and then so on and so forth, uh, such that it'll actually kind of give the, uh, the socially desirable outcome that all of us aspire to. Now, if you add learning systems on top of that, where we're all kind of putting in our data and when it's learning from us and we're learning from them, it just becomes much more rich and complicated. And uh, um, so, yeah, definitely, I'm, I'm much, very much on the side of some, some regulation and it's kind of the right mix. If you try to do it all top down, it's going to totally not work. The, the, the kind of the free market people are right about that. Um, think about another kind of market just to be con so you can help your think yourself think is um, the, the suppose that I'm trying to build an app that gets people to the airport as quickly as possible. All right. Yep. Uh, we already have apps kind of like that. Right. And um, so it, you know, it records some data and it figures out that a certain path from here to A to B is like the fastest, you know, based on the data. Um, you know, that's great. So now it recommends if I'm at A, if I don't want to get to B, it'll recommend a certain path to me. Uh, and if only me is using the app, then great. Or for a few people are using it, fine. But what if everyone in the city is using it, mm -hmm. right? Now it'll send everybody from A to B and it creates congestion, all right? Mm -hmm. There's an economic phenomenon, there's scarcity that's not being respected. All right, so at that point you could say, well, okay, I screwed it up. Um, it's my job to figure out how to do the load balancing. I shouldn't be sending everyone A to B. So who do I send from A through C to B instead and do the slower path? Mm -hmm. Well, now it becomes hard to know, you know, maybe I, sh maybe I think I know you, you're an you're a impatient kind of person. So I'll send you down the fast route or you're an impatient kind of person, right? You can see all the trouble I'm gonna get into. Uh, rather at that point, you gotta sort of abandon being the pure top down, you know, uh, regulation oriented computer science person. <laughs> and be the more open markets person. You say, well, I'm gonna give it as an option to people. They can pay a little bit more, maybe to go down the street that's fast because they know they're in a hurry today and they're willing to part with a little of their money to, uh, or they're today, actually, they're not subject to hurry, they'll save some money for the future. So uh, add some auction mechanism in there and do it in a clever way so they don't actually have to run an auction as you're trying to figure out how to get to the airport, uh, yeah. but have an avatar running an auction for you. Um, and now you can imagine that, you know, people go on the road that they're most, you know, that helps some of their utility. They get there quickly enough uh, for their purposes. Uh, so now we've kind of created a, a economic style, you know, information flow kind of system that maybe some experience about us, but also uses our in the moment kind of knowledge that we're looking for and creates a, a system that overall would maybe make people happier. We wouldn't, um, make the, only the rich get richer or, or, or create congestion because we're doing it being stupid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what was really interesting in that example for me is that if you layer on this idea that, you know, the, it, it, the future will have these kind of marketplaces that you're describing and the marketplaces will have, you know, built in, you know, learning systems and intelligences, uh, but the the players as well will have, you know, learning systems in the form of agents or whatever. If we layer that into your example, you know, even today you can, you know, open up your phone and it'll tell you, oh, it's time to leave to the, you know, to go to the airport because you have a flight at, you know, whatever time. 
Um, you know, those algorithms, I think, are, you know, based on, you know, kind of map style algorithms. Uh, yeah. But you can easily imagine, you know, these interactions between the, you know, optimization that's happening in the market and the optimization that's happening, you know, with, with your agent that's representing your interests and trying to either, you know, save you time or gas money or whatever it is. Um, and in the fields of economics and, um, and, you know, game theory, there's all kinds of research into interacting systems and, and how they behave and, you know, what is overall equilibrium, things like that. Uh, when I think about, you know, kind of bringing it back to ML and AI, I'm starting to think about things like adversarial relationships, which we're studying. Are there other examples of, you know, where we're studying these kind of interacting learning systems at, at this scale? Yeah, we're not studying enough. Um, th there, there are a lot of people, uh, there's, a, there's a community called EC, uh, Economics and Computation, that there's a conference that's devoted to it. And it's sort of not in the central of, you know, a lot of machine learning people don't know about it. And I, I may even have given the wrong actual, uh, the, the acronym is EC, but I think it's economics in computation or and computation. But anyway, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's, it's people who study really kind of algorithms meets economics. And there's not that much learning there, but there's, there's, uh, there's some people, the, the few people in the world who, who do study those things are, are often found there. Um, and, uh, you know, you can, there's things like, um, what if I have many, many actions, like in a classical game theoretic setting, there's like two actions or, or 10, or there's not hundreds of thousands. But in our world, um, there's often hundreds of thousands, all the treatments I could have for some, you know, medical condition, or all the paths I could take to the airport, or all the restaurants I could go to in Shanghai, you know, et cetera, et cetera, all the books I could read. All right. So, um, so classical game theory doesn't have a lot of kind of 100,000 by 100,000, you know, or, or million by million game tables. Uh, if they had had those, they would have realized there's no way I'm going to know the numbers in that game table. All right. And so that's where we come into the picture, which is that we're telling you how from data to get numbers like that. All right. Um, and, but now we can do things like, well, I can't explore all those numbers. I can't try every restaurant. I can't try every patch report, but, but you try it and you're my friend. All right. And, and so like recommendation systems are explicitly about that is that um, as a community, we try a bunch of options and then somehow the, the algorithms figure out a way to make recommendations that would fill in entries in the table, even though we would never experienced them before. Um, and also there's kind of an exploration exploitation idea in, in learning and statistics, which is really, really critical, which is, you know, um, there's many options I have to try today, you know, things I could try to do. Um, some of them I try because they give me a reward. You know, I had a nice dinner and, and so on. Um, some of them I try because I want to explore and because maybe for the future, I'll, I'll want to do that instead. And and life is kind of a mixture of these things. And so good machine learning people are aware of kind of no algorithms for trying to mix these things. It's not that common in other fields. A lot of other fields are either pure explore or pure, pure exploit. Um, so you can now think about kind of economic systems where, um, you know, I'm trying to get to the airport, but, you know, maybe I'm like in Italy, and I'm kind of just happy to also see this countryside a little bit, you know? I'm more in an explorer mode. Mm -hmm. um, and so since I'm an explorer mode, you know, maybe the system, you know, the avatar or whatever will kind of know that, and it'll kind of, uh, you know, give me a different experience than I might have otherwise had. It's not just trying to optimize in a, in a really dumb way. Um, you know, or uh, I go to the shopping mall, right? And nowadays there aren't really many shopping malls. But, you know, you, you can imagine that, or, or I go to a, a commerce site. Sometimes I really just want to go there and buy toothpaste. I know what I want. I want just very little, you know, in my way between me and the, the acquisition, right? But other times I go there and I want to learn what's the coolest, latest thing out there. I want to have a social interaction. I want to sort of be entertained and so on and so forth. Uh, and so if our virtual world, you know, our avatar driven virtual world was a little bit more like that, that it uh, recognized that now you're in explore mode, now you're in exploit mode and um, uh, then, you know, structure your interactions and structure the environment around you would reflect all that. Um, you know, that would be healthy and it wouldn't, it wouldn't need to know like, all the details about my life to do that. It wouldn't be invasive. It would really more be, as you said earlier, like the word empowered. It would allow me to sort of give a little bit of information such that it would structure the environment in a way that I would find uh, more appropriate for my current needs. Um, I think that the IT Silicon Valley world 
was very too much top down. They thought they could build the system and it would be perfect and it would know everything about you. And if it didn't know enough about you, it would look even more into your browsing history and it would bring together all this information and so much so that it would know what you would want and it would anticipate your every need. And that style of thinking is, you know, God damn it, it's still too much there. They, they, you know, they want this little secretary sitting next to you that know, anticipates your every need. That's the dream of AI. Well, I don't dream of having that secretary myself at all. Mm -hmm. You know, I dream of, of, of really, um, you know, having a, a, a few aspects of my state kind of, you know, taken respected and, and my utilities and my preferences. And I, um, you know, I want you to take some load off of me, but I don't want you to anticipate my every need because you cannot. And uh, the idea that a company would be able to do that is, is both frightening and, and unrealistic. Um, and so, yeah, this kind of idea, back off from that, folks, create something more like a little bit of a market where I go into a, if I go into a market here in Italy, you know, it's, 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 uh, people are trying to sell things to me, but they're acting, not acting like they know me that much. They're just giving me opportunities. To, um, and so our online world, I think, is, is, is needs to be more like that. Mm -hmm. and, and on that, is that a statement about, you know, first and foremost about kind of the centralization of, of data and or the, the centralization of, uh, you know, intelligence or, or is it about, um, you know, you just, you don't have any interest in the, you know, technology uh, being available to kind of enhance your life in that way? Yeah, uh, you're. That's a great question. You're you're heading in a direction I have less to say about, but um, very very interesting, important. Who who has the data, and who has the power because they have that, and, and those are critical issues. Because um, I'm hearing you say you'd love for this thing to you know get you on the scenic route in Italy, and you know yeah. you you know serendipitously maybe oh you know you're passing by this amazing thing. If you stopped for 15 minutes, you'd have the time of your life. Um, and, and kind of hinting at, you know, maybe more of the misgivings are the, the way that we're currently creating those experiences. Yeah, no, I, I uh, don't feel empowered by such a system. I feel bothered by such a system. And so I need to feel empowered. And there, there is a difference. And so this word power does matter to me. Um, uh, you know, so whether it's centralized or whatever, if you use my data, um, then that's okay with me. But if in some sense you use it and I get value out of your using it, mm. all right? So if you pay me in some sense for my data. Um, so in particular, uh, you know, a travel agent is a person who makes pl travel plans for lots of people and they get better and better and better over the years, right? So when I walk into that travel agent, they're just really good at it. They know how to get me from point A to point B in a great way. Well, why? Because they got you to that point. You know, they had experience in the past. So all your data is being used to help me. And are you unhappy about that? Well, no, that's what a travel agent does. They kind of take that data. And so a system that does that, that kind of, you know, somewhere, some partially de you know, anonymizes me, but that builds up experience dealing with people like me. And then I kind of know what I'm getting. You know, this travel agent doesn't need to know everything, but they, they took away enough to help somebody else. I'm good with that. The medical system, you treat me, it works for me. I want it to be available for you tomorrow right? I don't want to protect that data. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I do want data to flow and I do want it to quote unquote be centralized, but I don't want it to be used as an advertising model that you have a lot of data about me. Therefore, you can tell other people, the advertisers, how to come find me, right? That doesn't empower me. That doesn't help me and help you. Um, but for humans to help each other via, the, via data flows and for a company to help provide that, and then even take a bit of a cut. That's all. That's more more in my uh, that, that's more my comfort zone. Uh, so I would, yeah, definitely not a you know all on or all off here. You know, it's always in the middle. Um, it's no that it's not that there should be no you know data collections and centralization because that uh, f you know prevents you from actually having nice flows that are helpful to people. Um, you know, but um, but also not a just you can take my data willy nilly. No, there's got to be kind of a valuation of data. There's got to be that you pay me in some sense for data and that I'm kind of okay with that equation. So I go into your system. Uh, so if I go to a city and I'm, it's, it's a restaurant application, it's trying to give me recommendations of where to go. Um, 
You know, if I'm in a foreign city and I don't speak the language and it's seven o'clock and I'm hungry, I really would like something really, really good that knows enough about me yeah. and the environment and all that that can really put me in a good place to eat that it's not you know weird or scary or whatever. And I'm willing to give up a little bit of privacy for that about my past or about where I am and all, um, but not too much. Right. Mm -hmm. And and there, there needs to be a way to find that, you know, and so I think that's, again, somewhat economic here. There's a trade off being implemented there. It's a trade off between my privacy and the value I will get out of being, you know, uh, exp you know, uh, being helped with my decision that was otherwise extremely, extremely hard. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the travel agent example is a really interesting one to me. Um, I'm guessing that probably the vast, vast majority of our listening audience has never used a travel agent. Um, and, uh, you know, probably only those of us who have can appreciate what the, what a good travel agent really brings to the table. Um, and it makes me think that we think about this idea of, you know, we think about AI in the context of this digital divide and, you know, there will be you know, communities that will be left behind because they don't have ready access to, you know, AI technology. Um, but the travel agent example makes me think that in a lot of ways, it's, it's like a human divide in a sense and that, that we need to worry about and that the you know the knowledge of you know humans is going to be you know is going to be commoditized into these computational systems like ais and you know only the select few will have access to you know actual humans who know things and have have experiences and can um can help them in you know whatever the the endeavor is travel agent is a, a great example of that um you know, it gets really scary if it's, you know, in medicine, for example, where, you know, the, the masses are being treated by kind of the, the commoditized robot doctors, but, you know, only the select few can actually speak to a human doctor with real experience. Um, do, you, do you see that as a direction? Do you think economics plays into that? Is that something you worry about? Yeah, those are, I do worry about all of that. I think it's, those are very critical problems. Again, it's not enough just for someone like me to worry about it. It's got to be a joint effort of uh, lots and lots of people, um, you know. Uh, but indeed, bringing in all the right people and making sure there's a full-throated, diverse collection of people, you know, backgrounds and interests and all that associated with the role out of these things is so important, critically important. Um, and so, uh, you know, maybe a little bit on the optimism side, a lot of the things that I think are interesting about my own life are kind of contextual and local. And the knowledge that's available there is not something that Google's going to have. Most of the things about my life that are interesting and all Google doesn't know anything even to this day about, you know, my, my searching browsing pattern is pretty limited and uninteresting. And I click on all kinds of junk. I clicked on something the other day about, you know, the, the, the queen of England or whatever. It's just because I just was lazy and I just clicked on it. I have no interest in that whatsoever, right? <laughs> uh, and, you know, there's tons of really noisy, messy data in places like that that is kind of irrelevant within, you know, 30 microseconds, not to mention two years. Mm -hmm. All right. So most of us have a little more local environment around us that we help to construct and we participate in a little more like a village rather than a... Um, and um, by making and being, having that not being excluded from that and having that be, uh, you know, a healthy, good place, um, I'm a little less worried about that there's going to be extreme stratification of, you know, the, this kind of technology. Mm -hmm. Also, AI, first of all, to be clear, this is data analysis, really. It's not magic. Uh, these are ideas that are totally open and available to, you know, they're on the archive. They're simple algorithms. Yeah. There is no mystery. People all over the world know what gradient descent is and um, and so on and so forth. So moreover, computers are pretty much a commodity nowadays. And the data, again, it's very contextual. The data relevant for some situation in Brazil is not the data that's relevant for you know Palo Alto. Uh, and so it's not the Palo Alto people are gonna take over because they have all the, you know, the goods. Um, and then the people trained to solve the problems are also local too. So um, I still think our local community building and our cultures and all that are going to be, you know, critically important as we go forward. Um, but there shouldn't be kind of, you know, fiefdoms and, you know, uh, enclaves, you know, there should be, 
let you know and so it's going to require um you know all the right kind of people to be involved in the construction of as we build so the medical one is a good example you know covid has definitely decimated minority communities more than it has decimated you know rich and white communities and this is a great example of that hey shouldn't that be like oh you know why should there be a racial discrepancy there you know it's a it's a goddamn virus well, there is, because that reflects all of our ways of our systems have been built and, and have, have been built ad hoc and have built well without thinking about that. And those have got to be knocked down and broke and, and thought through and uh, make sure that those kind of things are, you know, mitigated and don't happen. Um, yeah, so uh, very, very important issues. And I just think mostly it's less about, you know, those of us who think about the mathematics and the systems kind of doing it all right. It's but but ensuring that all the right people are in the room when the when the systems get get uh, built and when the, and then it's transparent all the way through there's never a kind of a black box that uh that the, the society can't look at mm -hmm. uh so we've been kind of going with the flow of this conversation and it's been wonderful uh and i do want to to kind of uh touch on a, a ml specific question but even before we we get to that one of the things that is you know just very clear in in chatting with you is that you know, you have tons of ideas and you're currently exploring, you know, kind of this intersection of uh, economics and uh, and machine learning and marketplaces. And, you know, you've again, we've you've worked in biology and, and other fields. I'm just curious, you know, in getting a little meta here, your you know, process or philosophy and kind of wrangling these ideas and turning them into, you know, interesting or even award-winning research, uh, you know, or economic endeavors. Um, yeah, thanks for asking. Let me just sort of say, that I, to me, that's a question that's more about um, talking about younger researchers, how they could kind of get into this field, really. That, that's what comes to me, because I don't think I have any major secrets myself. I wouldn't look at my own career, my own uh, way of approaching things and say, wow, there's, I figured it out. Well, I didn't, you know, and, and so part of it is I've been doing it for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but, you know, secondly, I think that, um, that uh, most of the challenges, if you start to realize what a, a real challenge is, one that will make a difference, uh, that impacts or at least touches on issues that people care about, um, that, uh, you know, is worth kind of a two or three years of your time. Those are the kind of the ones I go after. Um, if, if it's going to be like a month of my time, I'm not particularly interested. And if it's going to be hopeless, you know, like, you know, Fermat's last equation, so I just, no, either. I, so I kind of find these ones that two or three years of my time. So I get up every morning and I make a little progress on it. And I just, for especially for young people, just sort of each one of you is smart enough to work in this field. Each one of you knows enough. And so, you know, but make sure you pick a problem that is kind of meaty and it feels like it's not obvious and it's not what everybody else is working on. It's kind of got your own flavor to it. And it feels like after two or three years, you should be able to make some progress on it. And then just keep getting up and hacking at it every day, you know, and if you get a little frustrated, pull back for a while. Um, but that said, every day, I'd like to say that half of my day is devoted to just kind of exploration. I read books on stuff. I think about, you know, I look at what other people are doing or, you know, I just learn about something brand new that I've not known about before. Half of my day, if I can, this is on good days. And then half of my day is devoted to this. Let's keep moving some projects along. Let's keep kind of doing where I was doing. And if it's not moving along, you know, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll kind of refocus. But um, but those time scales are really important to me. Kind of, you know, the, the main one is kind of my overall life. Have I been thinking through all the things I kind of want to think through? What matters? Do I know enough about X, Y, and Z? You know, so, um, and often that is really literally getting out undergrad topic. So, you know, I'm learning economics and game theory and mechanism design. Uh, yeah, absolutely, because it's helping me to think about new uh, research directions. Well, the way I do that is I go find a really good uh, senior or junior level textbook. Um, and I read it like a novel because I just find it really fascinating. Wow, these people thought this, all this stuff. Moreover, I kind of already know enough math that I can kind of just read it without having a lot of struggle. Like even the undergrad would have struggled. I, I don't have to struggle. It's it's so fun. Um, and then I do that a little bit you know, all the time. Um, and over time, that's just kind of, you know, really helped and build up and give me a, a bit of a perspective. Um, you know, but I don't feel like I'm necessarily a thought leader that, uh, you know, I, I think that, um, I, uh, you know, 
I, I think that partly that has to do with the era you live in. And maybe we're arriving at the era now where thought leaders will emerge, that it kind of starts to become consequential. Our field is mattering enough now. Mm -hmm. And um, so that uh, we will be kind of burned by doing the wrong thing and we'll also kind of learn by doing the right thing. And then maybe after that, your experience will kind of you know, boost you to the level of thought leader. But we don't have a lot. Our, our machine learning field has not been very consequential. It's really been in this era of just gee whiz kind of, you know, stuff. Um, and behind the scenes, people have used it to build kind of you know, infrastructure for things like you know, Amazon or Google. And that's all great. And some of those people um, maybe have, a, you know, gotten real perspective. But it, often it's very, very technical and very, very buried. Um, and our field hasn't kind of emerged like some other fields where they were really having consequences for the human life. Um, so I'm kind of hoping the younger people will realize that this is what's happening, that our field is going to have major consequences. So educate yourself broadly, spend time every day learning lots of things and learn how to talk to the outside world, not just yourselves. Um, so, um, so I'm not sure I answered your question, but I hope that was a, in, in no, that, the spirit that, of your question. That, that's a great uh, answer to that question. I think the, the way you structure your time around uh, a, a thoughtful balance of explore and exploit is is an interesting answer to that question. Um, and, and so to, to kind of close things out, you are you know very well known for kind of the popularization of a bunch of you know techniques in the machine learning community. You know Bayesian networks, variational methods, approximate inference, expectation maximization. Uh, any thoughts on kind of the, you know, technical direction or, or elements of, uh, you know, the re of research or, um, you know, where you see things going kind of at this, um, you know, the intersection of machine learning, computers and statistics? Um, yeah, no, I have lots of thoughts about that kind of thing. Um, uh, if the, especially younger people want to learn more about my work and thoughts about that, I have, there's talks on the web that you can find. And um, I think just to say briefly, uh, a lot of my work has to, uh, had to do with optimization, kind of what's the best way to do something. And even kind of lately, kind of what's the optimal way to optimize. And so this word variational has had a real impact on my career, my life and my thinking. Variational just means you take a problem and you turn it into an optimization problem. All right. And having done that, you can often get new perspective on ways to kind of tweak that optimization a little bit and solve a slightly different problem and get inside of your original problem. And so variational methods of all kinds are still kind of very part of my, my, my way of thinking. Um, optimization also has to do with uh, change. It has to do with movement, it has to do with dynamics. So a lot of my work has to do with dynamical systems, uh, differential equations, partial differential equations, stochastic differential equations, how fast they converge, how well they do in high dimensional spaces. Um, and then with this economics kind of uh, perspective that is driving me a lot now, um, th the problem is now not just to go down, down downhill and find at the minimum of a surface. It's often to find an equilibrium among multiple agents. So how does each agent kind of move towards equilibria? So the classical equilibrium of game theory, you know, limited perspective, you know, Nash and Stackelberg and all. That's just kind of how do you get there? It, you know, was never really talked about. Well, the whole question is how do you get there? And how does data inform how do you get there? And even in, if there's multiple people interacting in a complex world, you may never get there. It's more about the how do you move. And so lots and lots of interesting things having to do with stochastic dynamics and uh, in the context of games um, and our perspective on high dimensional optimization and, and so on and so forth. So I, I just have a lot of fun with all the, the huge mathematical challenges there. Um, yeah, a lot of them are mathematical dynamics and dynamical systems. Uh, but then always behind the scenes is always about inference, about how did you sample things from the real world? What can you say about the real world based on what you got after your algorithm runs? What's that tell you about the real world? What's your uncertainty? And all these things. So statistics is kind of in some ways my home field where my heart really is. Uh, it is the field where I think the biggest challenges are about you're trying to say something about the real world based on something partial. Um, and that continues to be, I think, uh, the hardest and most uh, worth worthy field um, for many of us. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, Michael, thank you so much for taking the time to share a bit about what you're thinking about nowadays with us. Um, it was wonderful speaking with you. It was a real pleasure to talk to you too. Great questions and uh, a lot of a fun hour for me too. Thank you very much. Thank you.